it's hard, you know, understanding, you know, how you can talk about design in a way to make clients comfortable so they'll do something that's contemporary because a lot of them will want to default to something that's more historical. This is episode 67. This is The Business of Architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I am your host, Enoch Bartlett Sears, and you're about to discover strategies, tips, and secrets for running a fun, flexible, and profitable architecture practice. To get access to training, webinars, and other insider-only resources, head on over to businessofarchitecture.com and join today. In this episode, Los Angeles architect Stuart Magruder is going to tell us how he launched his design-oriented practice, and he's going to share with us the secret that the world's most prominent architects use to produce creative design-oriented projects. But first, did you hear about the Business of Architecture online conference? It's going to be happening October 16th and 17th. Now, this is the event this year for architects who want to grow their practice or reach new levels of personal success and growth. Head over to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash conference and get on the early notification list. Now, today's show is underwritten with generous support from BQE Software. They're the developers of Archie Office. For more than 10 years, architects from sole proprietors up to firms with hundreds of employees have relied on Archie Office to power their office and empower themselves. You might want to consider it too. Let your computer do the administering. Head on over to archieoffice.com for more information. Now, today's guest is architect Stuart Magruder. Stuart is a powerhouse of energy, passion, and a gifted designer as well. After working for the firms of Eric Owen Moss and Richard Meyer, Stuart headed out to start his own practice in 2005. He's a past president of the Los Angeles AIA chapter, and he was given the Young Architects Award in 2011. As a member of the Los Angeles Unified School District Bond Oversight Committee, Recently, Stuart made national news because he was not reappointed to the committee because he was asking some hard questions about some of the expenditures of the bond facility funds. You can hear more about that in last week's episode. So without further ado, here's today's show. Well, Stuart, you know, this is the Business of Architecture show, and so I'd also like to get your thoughts on running your own firm because I'm reading here on your website, you describe your firm as a design-oriented, uh, younger firm. So there's a lot of energy that I that I pick up just reading your story here. So Tony, just take me back a little bit about the beginnings of your firm, if you will, and sure, take sure. us to that dialogue. There's probably going to be interested in hearing that. Yeah, yeah, no, it's um, um, you know, I had uh, the good fortune of working. Um, I graduated from CyArk in 1997 and um, went to work for Eric Owen Moss, uh, who's Actually, right now, the director of CyArk as well. He wasn't at the time, but, um, and worked for him for a couple of years and learned a heck of a lot, uh, working for him. He does, you know, for the listeners who know his work, they'll know what I'm talking about, but he does this crazy, crazy stuff, um, super non-Euclidean. And, um, you know, trying to draw what he designs was really hard. So I learned so much. Great place to, to be, uh, uh, to, to learn the craft. And then, um, uh, from there, I went to Richard Meyer's office in Los Angeles, um, run by uh, a really talented architect named Michael Palladino, and worked there for about six years, um, most all of it on the San Jose Civic Center project, which is a uh, $300 million, 675,000 square foot uh, city government building for San Jose that included a, a rotunda bigger than the one at the Capitol in D.C., and, you know, a council chamber theater type space or not theater but you know chamber space um and then a tower component in this big public plaza um you know so really a fantastic project with you know all the challenges you get with a you know a 17 story tower component and just underground stuff and you know it was, it was a great challenge with thousand sheet drawing set and um so i worked on that for about five of the six years that i was there and uh kind of from the initial 3d drawings I was doing um, when I first came on board to helping close out the project. Um, so a great experience and and then uh, got a client that had a big enough contract for me to jump off on my own. I was licensed and I jumped off 
and started working for him. And then soon after that, I got fired by the guy. So, <laughs> my, well, take my, me back. Uh, how does that? How did that happen? So you're you're working. You're, it sounds like you're pretty satisfied to be working at Richard Meyer's office, and you worked on this great project in San Jose. Uh, you're 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 networking. You're getting relationships. How did that conversation start? That hey, I have this project. Do you want to come out and tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, no, it was, I mean, I always had a goal of going off on my own. That was always kind of in the back of my mind. And so I was, um, really kind of focused on getting, uh, you know, the licensure stuff out of the way. So I kind of plowed through that fairly quickly. Um, which is another thing I'd recommend that everybody just, just get the dang thing done. And I know we're, that's one of the things we're trying to change, I think, uh, nationally is to, to change it so you can sit for your license after you get your, your masters of architecture, which would be a huge, huge you know, improvement in and, our profession and, and you know, it's what lawyers do it's what doctors do i don't know why architects don't do it that way mm-hmm. so we're working on it, changing that but um but yeah no i always had the goal of being off on my own and, oh, and um, why why well you know i think that in the end we all want to we all want to express our creativity right and i think that's a, a basic human need that's why i think why the arts are so important um, although much maligned right now, but I think in the end, we all want to express ourselves, you know, whether it be, you know, through designing buildings or I watch my kids playing instruments and just playing an instrument as a way of expressing kind of your own innate creativity. So I, you know, more than happy to, to help express, you know, Eric Moss's ideas and Michael Palladino's ideas when I was working for them. But at a certain point, you know, I wanted to kind of make the decisions about, you know, design moves and, and express, you know, the ideas I've got about, how buildings should be. So um, that was why I kind of had in my own head the kind of desire to, to launch off on my own. So yep. and tell um, me about that first project. How did you meet the the client? And you know, tell me how did how yeah, you approached you yeah, about no, I'd, that? Yeah, and I'd done um, you know some projects on the side um, while working uh, for for Meyer. And okay, hold on a second. So we're talking about moonlighting here. Yeah. And. Yeah, uh, so I, what was uh, Meyer's office? What was their policy on that? You know, I don't know. I just did it all in my own time. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, but it's really, you know, it's it's a key. A lot of people, I mean, a lot of, uh, I think it's fairly common, you know, out there. I see it, you know, even engineers I know moonlight. And, um, so I think it's, you know, as long as you can get your, your day job work done and, and handle the other, I think it's okay. Um, and it's a key way to kind of understand on a small scale how to, how to run the whole project. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things I learned quickly is just, and you don't really see this when you're working for someone else, um, the the length of time it takes to actually get a project, you know, even in design is tremendous and much longer than I think most people are aware of until they're actually sitting there waiting for a client to sign a contract mm-hmm. and give them that first retainer check or whatever it might be. Um, so the whole kind of the you know the the process is is much more stretched out than I think you know is is clear to certainly the students and I think even to to those who are working at another uh, you know working for someone else you know unless you're right there trying to get a client to sign a contract and you know going out and meeting them and doing lunch with them or whatever it might be um, you know it's it's a it's a it's a it's not a quick process it's usually it's the biggest thing almost always it's the biggest expenditure anybody will will have whether it be a person building their own house or a company building, you know, their own building, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's the biggest thing they spend money on mm-hmm. yep. in, in terms of one shot deal. So, yep. um, so it's not a quick, it's not a quick, uh, you know, selection process and decision, you know, process. Um, so, so yeah. So anyways, I, a friend of mine who at the time was running a gallery here in LA had a, a coworker whose dad was looking to redo their house in the Hollywood Hills. And, um, you know, so I, you know, went and talked to him and things look good and we signed a contract and, and off we go. Um, so, so that gave that you was, enough runway for how long God, at, I, at that time? Do you remember? I probably repressed all those details. Now yeah. it, was, it was, it was a good challenge. Um, it was probably about six months where yeah. things were going fine. And then, um, he just wasn't happy with the, the design. And, um, you know, I think, uh, to my, you know, it was one of those things where I learned uh, a good bit about just, you know, I think he really lo- was looking for something conventional in terms of like a Spanish style. Mm, you know, let's, let's, out. let's talk about that for a second, yeah. Stuart, because this is this is one of those classic conflicts that comes up a lot, at least 
uh, it has for me coming out of a design-oriented school. And it sounds like there was maybe a mismatch here in terms of expectations. Right. So tell me yeah, about exactly. that learning process. Tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, it's a hard one. I mean, I think, you know, especially when you're, it's not like you have a, at the time I didn't have a, you know, website with, you know, what I have on it now. So yeah. it wasn't clear the work I was doing. And, you know, I was clear with them about, you know, the client. I was clear that I was, you know, he knew I was coming from Richard Meyer. And I think he understood that was a contemporary you know, focus practice, not a not a stylistic practice, and um, you know, so it 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 uh, it seemed like um, we were just kind of talking past each other, and and I think I learned that I probably wasn't listening well enough mm-hmm. you know, to what he was saying. Mm-hmm. Um, in retrospect, I hope he, you know, I don't know if he thought he wasn't saying clearly that he wanted something Spanish style, but um, I guess in his mind he thought he was. So I think both of us weren't kind of listening as well as we could have, um, you know, and certainly in the end, that's my job more than his to understand what he's trying to convey. Um, and so I didn't do that very well, uh, with that one. And, you know, it was, it was a good, good way to, you know, the hard thing though is, you know, sometimes what I found is that stylistic work seems very accessible to most people and they kind of get it and they feel comfortable with it and they feel like they can't mess up with it. So I think that's why the default can often be towards doing something that's historical-ish looking. People, a lot of people, most people, unless they've been kind of kind of aware of the issues or had some you know ability to access you know contemporary design issues or contemporary art issues, are not going to be as comfortable just off the bat with something that you know by and large there, there isn't a real rule book in contemporary architecture. Right, you can do seventeen thousand different things in contemporary architecture, whereas if you're doing Spanish, you know, style architecture, there's, there's kind of a pretty decent rule book you follow, you know, in a pattern, and you kind of apply it. Um, so it's it's much it's much more of a you know, doing contemporary work is much more a, much more of a leap into the unknown because you don't know where you could end up. Really, if you're doing it well or designing well, I think you're never going to know where you end up uh, when you start. You know, it's a process you go through to, to figure out how do I best solve this problem that, that you know, that the client needs solved, you know, the program or, the, you know, whatever it might be that's the real challenge or sustainability or whatever it is. So, um, you know, I think it's hard, you know, understanding, you know, how you can talk about design in a way to make clients comfortable so do something that's contemporary because a lot of them will want to default to something that's more historical. Um so how did that how did that initial yeah. experience, Stuart, change your the way that you uh, communicated yourself to clients, presented yourself, and then tried to attract new clients? Yeah, I think I, I tried to just be a lot clearer that you know, you know, I'm really focused on contemporary work, and um, you know, I think I also though became a bit less dogmatic about what does contemporary mean, and so. You know, previously I always wanted to kind of have a flat roof. And I realized that's kind of silly. You know, not only construction technology wise can it be more of a hassle not to have a flat roof or to have a flat roof. You know, maybe there's, there are ways to do contemporary that, that have pitch roofs and they're quite contemporary. So, you know, I also became a little less dogmatic and, you know, I had one client who, um, the project ended up being unbuilt for kind of difficult personal reasons on his end, but, um, you know, it was a project uh, kind of a little north of L.A., and he wanted something that that spoke to kind of, you know, more Italian hill town type stuff, and but was willing, you know, to do something that was very minimal. But because I was pitching the roofs and because things were kind of broken up and modulated so it looked almost like a little village, you know, he was comfortable with that design and loved it and really wanted to build it, but just... Mm-hmm. The Great Recession happened to all of us. So, um, yeah. but but uh, um, so I think that you know it was it was good kind of um, that that being fired kind of shook me out of kind of assumptions about a how to talk to clients about the type of type of work that I'd like to try to do, and then b how to expand what I saw as the possibilities for the work I wanted to do. You know. I mean, everything I do is going to tend towards minimalism, but 
you know, it can be, there's such a broad range of kind of formal ways you can attack a problem, you know, that, uh, uh, that are still minimal, minimalistic, but, um, you know, contemporary, but, uh, but without being kind of stuck on, you know, one set of shapes. And speaking about broadening horizons and possibilities, just wanted to remind you that today's show is made possible through the generous support of BQE Software, the developers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is designed and built by architects for architects. And let's face it, we didn't go to architecture school so we can spend most of our days dealing with paperwork, buildings, and product management. Now, ArchiOffice is a powerful software suite that focuses on one thing, giving you the information you need as an architect to run a productive and profitable firm while freeing you up to do what you love most, probably designing great projects. Now back to our show. And you started out in 2002, so you've been doing this for 12 years, so it's not like this is you know, something you've just been doing for a little while. Yeah, I mean, I, I started moonlighting in 2002. Um, okay. I started my firm at the end of, um, I guess it was 2005. So kind of really in, in 06, yeah. So Yeah, so, you know, still, we're, we're good, talking... Good amount of time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and Definitely. So do you find, or, you know, when your clients come to you, Stuart, are they, how educated are they in terms of design? How how much educating do you find yourself doing? It sounds like with the one project you just gave as an example of, there was a little bit of you educating the client in terms of design principles, and, yeah. you know, it doesn't need to look like an Italian villa to still embody the feeling of an Italian right. hillside villa. Yeah. No, it's it's a tremendous part. I mean, you know, to be honest, the the um, and this is probably something you and all your readers and listeners will know well. The, you know, you can't do great architecture without great clients, and maybe the greatest client is someone who's built before. <laughs> you know, yeah. because you understand the process and how long and difficult and mm. twisty turny it is. Um, but it's also, you know, if if you're in kind of the vibe that I'm in, which is this minimalist contemporary and then trying to be highly sustainable, although that's another challenge in and of itself. Um, that's a smaller subset of the kind of the general population that is interested in that type of work. So, so it's really, it's all an education process. And, you know, I still, still struggle with, you know, what's the best way to convey that I can safely provide and help deliver a building for this client, you know, how do I not scare them off by showing a minimal building? It's the real challenge. You know? And how how do you do that? God, I don't know. I mean, it's it's like it 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 every time it's different depending on who I'm talking to. You know, it really does shift depending on the client. Um, a lot of it is just talking about you know, um, kind of different approaches that have worked in the past that I've tried. Um, talking about you know what's out there in the culture, both our architectural culture, but in our general culture. That's you know. Maybe says this type of language is okay. Um, you know, I find uh, the you know I do a lot of modeling and sketch up, and you know, doing what I consider an architectural model. So I don't ever do anything that is photorealistic. I find that extremely deceptive. Um, so all my stuff is an architectural, you know, 3D. Uh, but being able to kind of model the site, put the building in place, turn on the sun. And then move around the model with the client there. That's a tremendous, you know, um, tool that I think really helps convey ideas and, and helps kind of ease heartburn for the clients. Cause again, this is the most expensive thing they're ever going to do. And especially, you know, that's why going back to this idea of working for somebody who's built before, you know, especially if they haven't built before, they're terrified of the process. And are they going to get taken? Is the contractor going to screw them over? Is the architect going to create a liability for them that they have to sue for? You know, they've got all of these concerns that are totally legitimate that they have to wade through. And, you know, it's your job to figure out how to kind of, you know, ease their heartburn and, and let them know that, you know, you know, yes, these sort of details are fine. And yes, we can do this you know, here. And, you know, we oriented it this way because of the sun. And, you know, you just kind of talk them through, you know, the reasoning behind why things might, you know, look the way you're proposing to them. And, and so that's, you know, that's really 99% of the challenge is just, you know, that communication and that, you know, patience with your client as they, um, you know, you know, learn and, and, and understand what you're trying to, to say to them. So um, when, when do you kind of decide, you know what, you know, I'm just not getting through to this person. I'm not going to be doing a Spanish style ranch. 
you know, it's it's best that we just not kind of do business together. You know, usually, it's funny, usually you can tell pretty quickly if the client has any aspiration. Yeah. And, you know, that's really what it is for me. Like, the ideal client aspires to do more than just build. Mm. You know, we want yep. to build I something that, ins- that is poetry. We want yeah. to build something that inspires people and makes makes humanity better. You know, that's why we're doing this, I think. I mean, it, you know, I'm certainly not doing it for the money. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> none of us are making that much. Although, you know, maybe, you know, you do fine, but it's not like you're, you're, we're bankers, right? Right. So if it's, you know, the, and that goes back to, you know, why I started my own firm. You know, you want to feel like, and I want to feel like I'm making a real difference in, in, in how, you know, this little building is going to help this neighborhood in Los Angeles do a little bit better. And, you know, you look around at where there's good architecture and then you see stuff that isn't good. And I think there's a real difference in how that makes the public feel. You know, when there's space that works well, the public's happy. They, they're outside at night. They're interacting with other people. There's, you know, yeah. it, it's good space is the grease for social interaction. Stuart, you know, you, shitty you, space, you know, really causes friction. And right? you, you, uh, something you said just was interesting. You mentioned, uh, you know, we, we're not in this for the money or we're, none of us are getting rich. Is it either or? No, it's not. I mean, I think, you know, I think a lot of us are horrible business people. So okay. I think that, you know, I think, you know, I've, Lucky. That you know, is a very right? honest confession, my friend. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm not sure if I'm lucky or cursed, but most of my family is in kind of business. Mm. And all my family. I'm the, I'm the weirdo. Mm. So, nice. um, and I worked in advertising for, for, for four years after college, oh. you know, in New York on Madison Avenue. And so I really got to, you know, be right in the middle of kind of. Whoa, know, whoa, hold on a second. I gotta, I gotta stop here <laughs> for a minute. <laughs> Okay, you worked in Madison Avenue uh, yeah. in advertising? Yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't convinced okay. I wanted to, to do architecture. I majored in architecture at Princeton, but it's a it's a it's a um, a bachelor's of arts. It's not even a bachelor's of architecture. At yeah, it's, a, it's like an English major or a math major. Sure. So it's not a professional degree. So, yep. um, you know, I wasn't sure I wanted to go to grad school. I wasn't sure I wanted to become an architect. So I, I jumped into advertising for four years and went through this amazing um, training program for become an account executive, which is kind of the manager that does kind of manages the whole process uh, in advertising and um, worked for DDB Needham, the, you know, Hershey Chocolate and then Michelin Tires and then went to another firm, Wells Rich Green. Uh, and so that pulls in a whole other dis- multidisciplinary side of things. How do you feel that that particular track has influenced uh, both your business and your design? You know, I think it, I mean, it, it definitely has had a big, big positive impact on how I run the business mm. and, you know, my kind of, you know, kind of focus and awareness on just being financially prudent and, you know, billing my clients, you know, right on time and I get my Mm. bills out and then, Mm. you know, just being aggressive on the billing side, I think is really important. Um, But just, and just, you know, having some understanding of kind of cost and I can put together a good spreadsheet and all that sort of stuff. Um, You know, and I think that's, you know, that's uh that's it's good experience and 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 also just seeing you know how how kind of the the overall business world works is 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 very helpful Stuart, you mentioned that you know just in general in society that people who appreciate and understand design are a much smaller s- subset right and I know especially as you go out of metropolitan areas, it's probably even a smaller subset of people that that get design right so what would you say to designers or young architects firm owners out there? who want to do contemporary design, they don't want to be constrained by style, but they, they have that challenge of not necessarily having what might be considered clients that are sophisticated and understand design oh. in that term, in those terms. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, um, I look at the architects who are really good, and, and I, I'm not counting myself in that group. You know, people who really build a lot, you know, uh, here in L.A., um, and the people doing really good, interesting stuff. I mean, look at someone like Tom Mame or, you know, Angie Brooks and Larry Scarpa or, um, you know, Patrick Ty or the list goes on, right? Tons of great designers here. Almost to a, to a person, they are extremely charismatic people. And I think in the end, the thing that you got to make sure you've got is you've got to be able to sell yourself and your design ideas to 
uh, you know, to clients. And you've got to make them comfortable. And so being charismatic is a, is a real key way of doing that. Um, so, you know, or maybe another way of putting it is you've got to be comfortable selling an idea. And, whoa, whoa and, wait a second. <laughs> yeah. Artists selling their ideas? Isn't that, does, well, see, I don't does this think, actually I, happen, Stuart? Yeah, I don't think we're artists. I actually take exception to that. I really, artists deal in a completely different universe than we do. They deal in the universe of essentially no constraints. I mean, there are gravity constraints, there are financial constraints, there are space constraints, but they're constraints of their own making, right? We deal with tons of constraints clients, codes, budgets in, in particular, and what the construction trades will, is our comfortable building. We have massive, massive constraints that we have to deal with. So we have to be really, really, really good at selling our ideas or else, you know, the person who can say, oh, I don't think, you know, the contractor will try to dumb down your idea because it's cheaper if it's dumber is going to win the day unless you can sell better than that person. You know, it becomes a battle of wills over, you know, this is what we have to do. Um, and to do it, you know, you've got to be able to, to, to convince and, and you know, um, cajole in a positive sense, you know, your clients on this path, this journey with you to make something that is different. You know, um, you know, you look at somebody like Rem Coolhouse. I mean, what an amazing salesman, right? What an amazing storyteller. You know, my, my good friend and, and sometime partner, Rick Abramson, he, he talks about how important stories are to, you know, selling ideas. And that, that's, that's it. You know, if we want to be successful, that's what we do. That is just a golden nugget. And that is probably a great place to end the conversation. I think that uh, you, you've given us, you know, we've talked about reach, getting involved in the AIA. But really, this, this, you know, I've never heard anyone mention that in terms of this, the selling skill. And I think that is, uh, it's a great insight, Stuart. Oh, good. Yeah, no, it's, it's one I'm still struggling to learn. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> what do you do to try to pick up? Cause not all of us are charismatic. I mean, let's admit it. Some of us are introverts and some of us yeah. just like to design. You know, what have you found to be useful in your life to maybe get some charisma or get some selling skills? Anything that's been um, useful? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually kind of an introvert trained extrovert. And, uh, so, you know, when I'm at a long meeting, I'll be exhausted just from the fact of being around, you know, and, and needing to communicate with people effectively. It's, it's tiring for me. I think extroverts do it. Just, it's like regenerative for extro extroverts to talk to people. And for me, it's, I've got to work hard to communicate well. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it's, you know, I think it's, it's really kind of, Maybe what it, for me, and I don't know if this holds really true for anybody else, but for me, it's been appreciating how people who do it well, you know, just watch them in action. You're like, oh my gosh, this guy's really good at this. This gal's really effective at, at making that point. Look how this person addressed the person just physically. Like, what was the body language? How did they look? At and that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.